Dasson from Brookhaven National Laboratory in the US. Uh, she's, um, you know, just a brief introduction. She, she's well known for her work, uh, mostly related to Higgs and collider physics. Um, and uh, she was the leader of the Higgs property working group for snow mass, which, which uh, the exercise uh, just, just got over recently. And um, uh, more importantly, for most of us, she is one of the author of this uh, Higgs Hunter's Guide that, that we uh, refer uh, quite uh, often. And uh, with that much of uh, introduction, uh, let me uh, request Sally to uh, give her talk, the Higgs and the SMT. Okay, thank you very much for this kind invitation. I, of course, always love talking about the Higgs. It's one of my favorite things. And this particular topic is completely appropriate because I spent the beginning of this week telling students why you can't use the Kappa approach to studying the Higgs and why you absolutely have to use the standard model effective field theory. So what I'm gonna do in this brief talk today is talk about things that have been happening in this SMEF. There's been a lot of progress in the theory world in our understanding of how to analyze Higgs data and how to get the most out of Higgs data. So this talk is really an update. And I should say I have my video on, but I'm not sure that the connection will be good enough. So if, if I break up, tell me and I'll switch it off. Okay. okay, so we always have to start these talks by saying that the standard model absolutely works. There's really no evidence that there's anything going on other than the Higgs boson. So in fact, our limits on new physics now, sorry, excuse me, now extend up to over a TeV in many channels. And this really challenges us when we look for new physics in the Higgs sector, because we know of so many things that aren't there. We know there aren't new scalar particles, new, new heavy quarks, new this, new SUSY particles. So we really have to be very, very clever when we're looking to tease out new physics from our data. So we also know not only have we not found any new particles, but even more importantly, from my point of view, is that every standard model process that we measure, it appears to have just the predicted rate. And I particularly like this plot here by Atlas, where they show the ratio of data to theory. And you can see it's pretty much right on one. So over many, many orders of magnitude, including the Higgs, everything we calculate comes out exactly the way we expect it to be, which is a real challenge for us. So everything's reasonably consistent with electroweak precision data. Also, of course, everyone has seen the new MW measurement, which pulls the fit further away from uh, the data. So here is a re recent fit, which includes the new MW. And you can see that the measured values, MT, MW, are a little bit in tension with uh, the inferred values without uh, including MW and MT. And of course, this is good for people who do precision physics and try to get new physics out of the Higgs because maybe we can exploit this little tension to learn something about Higgs couplings. So the idea is that effective field theory techniques might help us to find new physics at the LHC because the high lumi LHC will increase the data set dramatically, maybe by a factor of five or maybe more. But on the other hand, at the high lumi LHC, we don't expect our direct search reach to be hugely extended because mostly the direct search reach is controlled by the energy. So we've got to go for things of precision measurements. So the precision measurements of the Higgs properties will benefit tremendously from this increase in luminosity. And so generically, when I'm looking for new physics in the Higgs, I'm gonna be sensitive to sort of the one to 10 TV scale new physics. So if I just use this Kappa framework where I just have a fudge factor for how each coupling changes, generically, I think it might go like V squared over lambda squared. And the coefficient in front of this is, is one for generic weak coupling. Maybe it's one over 16 pi squared if the new physics arises in a loop. But we don't expect these, these changes to Higgs couplings to be very big. If I put in lambda the TeV, which is sort of the scale that we're probing right now at the LHC, this number comes out to be about 6%, which is below the measured precision. So this is a regime where we think this MEFT expansion might be valid because 
We have a scale lambda, which is going to be bigger than a TeV, and we have no evidence for any strongly interacting physics. So here's the SMEFT in a nutshell. So at the weak scale, say the Higgs mass, the W mass, the assumption is made that there are no new particles. So we're assuming that uh, there's no light stuff that we've missed, essentially. We're assuming there's no light uh, new Higgs scalar, no light uh, pseudoscalars, nothing, just the standard model particles. So the SMEFT assumes that all of the new physics at, is at a high scale. It's at a scale lambda much, much bigger than the W mass. And it furthermore makes the assumption that the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 gauge invariance is preserved. So the Lagrangian is pretty simple for the SMEFT. It's just a standard model Lagrangian, and then it's a tower of higher dimension operators. So there are dimension six operators, which go like one over lambda squared. There are dimension eight operators, which go like one over lambda the fourth, and so on. The odd uh, numbered uh, dimensions, say the dimension five operators, violate left time number. So I'm not going to consider those. So the SMEFT is particularly powerful at the LHC because it automatically includes the correlations between top data, between the electroweak precision observables, between Higgs data, between dipos on physics. So the, a global fit to data in bigger sectors than just the Higgs can incorporate more information, and then we can get to more insight into what's going on. So this is a SMEFT will fit to the Higgs data, but we also need to fit to the die boson data and so forth to really learn what's going on. And the other thing you get out of SMEF as opposed to the kappa fits is that the SMEF phenomenology can include the kinematic information, which is different from the standard model. So in the SMEF, many of these operators might have derivatives. And so the kinematics of the Higgs production and decay will be different. Okay, so in general in the SMEF, there are a great many operators. There are 200 or 2,499 operators, assuming B and L conservation. And clearly no experimentalist is gonna do a fit to this many operators. It's just simply not possible. So one always has to make assumptions about which operators to include in our global fit. And typically about 30 operators are considered in the global fits today. So these global fits make assumptions that um, are usually reasonable, but it's fair to say that they leave things out. A lot of times in these fits, there's not a complicated flavor structure, for example. So there have been a lot of new fits recently, and I have to stop here and apologize to the fit makers because I have a sampling of new fits, SMEF fits, just to illustrate some points, but it's by no means comprehensive of all the different things. So what you learn when you look at these fits, they fit to some number of operators here. I'm not sure how many here, I think it's about 30. They fit to operators that primarily contribute in the electroweak precision observable sector, in the bosonic sector, operators that modify the Yukawa couplings, operators that affect uh, two fermion operators two fermion processes and four fermion processes. So this particular fit, which is relatively recent, includes top data, Higgs data, electroweak precision observables, and dye boson data. And what it, you can learn from this particular fit is you can see the effects of including the top data on top of the other data. So in this top plot here, the yellow, and I guess they're yellow and red here, the, the red includes the top electroweak di boson and so forth. And the yellow one does not include the top operators. And you can see, if you stare at this, they're very small changes from including the top operators, mostly over here and things that affect the Yukawa couplings. So now in the SMEF at dimension six, let me go back here. Here's my dimension six operator. What we're measuring is a coefficient over the scale squared. So we cannot separate out the coefficients and the scale. So you cannot uniquely say that I'm measuring a certain scale. So what this plot at the bottom does is it sets the coefficients to various things which seem reasonable, to 1, to 0.01, or to 4 pi squared. And you can see the scales that vary depending on what your assumptions are about the coefficients. But this is the scale. So it's typically sort of 1 TeV-ish as you go across there. 
in no assumptions here do you really probe much above 10 TeV. So that's the lesson from our current methods is that we're probing an energy scale on the order of a TeV, maybe a little bit higher. So we can also note, here's another fit, fit by a group called SMEF fitter, that um, the precision varies over many orders of magnitude. So here you go, uh, from minus 100 to 100 here, and you're seeing these fits. And this particular fit also includes the top data, but it does a different expansion for doing the fit. So when I include the dimension six operators, I can ter terminate my expansion at one over lambda squared, or I can square my amplitude and include some one over lambda to the fourth terms. So if I include the quadratic terms from squaring my amplitude just to get the full cross section, I get the blue lines here. On the other hand, if I say, well, I'm only consistent to one over lambda squared, I get the orange lines. So these fits are tremendously sensitive to the assumptions we put into them. So it's a real challenge to our experimental collaborations to do these fits, both including the quadratic corrections and the linear corrections, see how they're different, to include the top data along with the Higgs data and the Di boson scattering data. So for the collaborations going forward, in order to get new physics from a theory point of view, at least, you need to do your fits, including data outside the Higgs sector. Finally, let me just make one more point about the fits. This is another fit by another group, the HEP fit group. And again, they fit a whole bunch of coefficients. And I think you're not gonna learn much by staring at the coefficients. It's a pattern that tells us things. So what they did in this particular fit was they fit all of the coefficients or they fit just one at a time. And if you fit just one at a time, it's the purple bands here. And you can get very, very misleading fits because it looks like your fits are super strong, but there are tremendous correlations in these fits. So the global fits will get limits which are not as strong as one at a time. So you can easily be misled in these fits. Okay, so this is mostly a pheno talk about the issues in interpreting the Higgs data in the standard model effective field theory. And I wanna emphasize what's new because this is a forward looking conference. We've had 10 years of the Higgs, but there's still so much to do. So there are a lot of new global fits. I showed you uh, three of the fits. They now include the CDFMW result, which changes the fits a little bit, but not tremendously because a lot of the power of the fits is coming from the electroweak precision observables. And then I wanna talk about what we call the Higgs inverse problem. And to me, that's one of the most interesting things. You measure all these coefficients, but then you say, well, so what? What do I learn from them? Do, do, do they tell me something about the model at a high scale? So I wanna talk a little bit about trying to take these fits and learn about what might be happening at some UV complete scale. And then I wanna talk about uncertainties in these fits. I've already showed you one fit where when you include one over lambda squared and one over lambda to the fourth terms, you get different uh, fits. But I also wanna discuss what happens when you try to include the next terms in the, the expansion, the dimension eight contributions because the fact that we can't expand infinitely far gives uncertainties in these fits. And I wanna discuss a little bit the effects of NLO, QCD, and electroweak corrections, because again, whether or not I include these corrections gives me uncertainties in the fits, and it turns out they're, they're rather large and important. And then I wanna talk a little bit about flavor and SMEF. So the Higgs inverse problem. So if we measure, excuse me, if we measure non-zero SMEF coefficients, can we determine the underlying high scale model? Because that's what we really wanna do. So in simple models, models which have just one new mass of particle whose interactions are then described in terms of a single parameter, the particles that can contribute to each of these dimension six operators have been categorized many years ago. So if I have a model with a singlet scale or a high scale, then I know exactly which coefficients are generated. Or if I have a model with say, a heavy vector like quark, again, I can predict exactly which coefficients are, are generated in that model. And then one can redo the fits, just interpreting them in terms of that kind of model. So for example, here we have 
three popular kinds of new models, an SU2 triplet gauge boson, I'll call it W1, an SU2 triplet scalar with hypercharge Y equals zero. And this is popular recently because this kind of triplet scalar can increase the W mass. Um, I can have a neutral gauge boson. I can have charge zero and charge one fermions, which look like heavy neutrinos and heavy leptons. And I can have many more things. This is just a simple uh, example. So for example, if I have an SU2 triplet gauge boson, the current data limited to be heavier than about three TeV. Whereas if I have an SU2 triplet scalar, the data limited to be similarly about uh, three, three TeV or heavier. On the other hand, the neutral gauge boson, say a Z prime with a U1, the limits are pretty good from these global fits. The limits are up at about eight TeV. Similarly with these heavy leptons, we get pretty good limits on these things. So already the global fits are probing mass scales in the TeV in, in particular models. So, we get into problems though when we try to make this more sophisticated, because of course these SMEF coefficients are defined at some high UV scale. They're defined wherever your model is applicable. So the running from the high scale down to say the W mass or the Higgs mass is a solved problem. And I put the uh, seminal papers down here because they're truly beautiful. So the coefficient function at the Wilson coefficient function at say the Higgs mass, we know the answer in terms of these anomalous dimensions here. And in fact, they're all tabulated for all 2,499 of the coefficients at dimension six. But the idea is that the running of the, these UV scale coefficients from things that are poorly constrained at the weak scale, the running may generate operators that are actually tightly constrained, changing the physics. So for example, if my UV complete model had a scalar singlet, a Z2 uh, violating scalar singlet, it would generate two of these coefficients, which I'll call CH box and CH. And these coefficients are actually rather poorly constrained if you go back to the global fit. But the running of these coefficients from down to the W mass actually generates a term which is proportional to CHD, which is the, essentially the T parameter, which is extremely well constrained. So that if you include the renormalization group running in your fits, you're going to get rather different constraints. Okay. Yes? Can I ask you a simple question? Uh, yes. Can you explain what do we mean by this uh, box? Is it... Uh, the oh, this box? is just the name of the coefficient. So H box which rate is different than the CH. Yes, this is this particular CH box is an operator which modifies the Higgs kinetic energy, whereas CH is an operator which gives you uh, H cubed, essentially. So they're just different operators in this expansion. So does it involve the Lambertian or something? No. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. You're breaking no. up. Does it involve the operator box? The Lambertian? No. no, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't write down what the operators were. So this is a, a modification of the kinetic energy term. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but the, the point is not the operator, it's that the model generates it and then it's renormalization group running generates an operator which is very tightly constrained, the T parameter. So you change your physics when you do this running. So for example, if I do the global fit to the scalar singlet model, a model which has just one scalar singlet at the high scale, and then I run the coefficients down, I actually get very tight constraints because of this running. So if I look at the electroweak precision observables, I get this purple circle. And if I look at the Higgs and Di boson channels, I get the blue circle. And you can see that by combining channels, I get a much tighter bound on the coefficients but in the model, I'm only allowed to be on this magenta line here, this blue line and this yellow line. So the whole phase space is not allowed. I'm only allowed to be on these lines here. So this is how we can use the fits to these general coefficients to try to tease out the information on the model. So 
The renormalization group running also complicates something we know about dimension eight. There are these positivity bounds on dimension eight operators. Certain combinations of dimension eight operators have to be positive and it comes from unitarity. So I actually wrote down the operators here. I apologize for not writing down the operators on the previous slide. So these are all dimension eight operators which involve derivatives and Higgs particles. And so if one calculates unitarity constraints on scalar scattering, phi, phi i, phi j goes to phi i, phi j, where some of these phi's might be the goldstones, there are constraints on these coefficients, which from a theory point of view are kind of interesting. But of course, what happens with this renormalization group running, if you calculate how these things change from the, the high scale to the W mass, say, you get uh, a term which is logarithmic here, and you can violate these bounds. So everything changes when we include these. So now let me move to uncertainties from this one over lambda squared expansion, which I alluded to when I showed the fits at the beginning. The amplitudes can be written in terms of dimension six operators, which go like one over lambda squared and dimension eight operators, which go like one over lambda to the fourth. So when I calculate a cross section, it's a standard model cross section, there's an interference piece between the standard model and the dimension six operators, which goes like one over lambda squared. And then there's a one over lambda to the fourth piece from squaring my dimension six operators. But there's also a piece from the dimension eight operators. And doing simplistic counting says that the square of the dimension six piece is generically the same scaling in one over lambda as the dimension eight piece. So what reason do I have to leave out the dimension eight piece? So this is the whole conundrum of how I do the expansions. So the, the global fits I showed you earlier, which were one over lambda squared, truncated the series at the C6 over lambda squared piece. The dimension six piece fits, which I showed you, which were labeled one over lambda to the fourth, included the C6 squared term. But now we wanna think about whether this term actually gets in the way of this whole interpretation. So there are two ways I can think about this. I can do an agnostic approach and say, I can pick out some uh, generic dimension eight operators. We now have a complete basis of dimension eight operators. I'll pick some out and see what they do to the, the fits and the cross sections. Or the other approach is I can pick my favorite models and then I can consider the effects in typical models. And of course we learn something from both effects. So here we go with the agnostic approach. So, this was done a, a few years ago. It was the first paper that really looked at dimension eight effects. And they looked at W Higgs production. And what they did was they picked out a, a couple of the dimension eight operators that contributed to WH production. And then they varied them to try to get the biggest possible effect, consistent with the idea that the dimension eight coefficients were part of a valid EFT expansion. In other words, that the dimension eight coefficients weren't bigger than the dimension six pieces. So what they did here is they looked at um, the dimension six approach and then they added these dimension eight terms. So the blue line here, this bottom line here is what you get just by including the dimension six contribution that contributes to this process. And they only included one dimension six operator. And then the black dashed line, this one on the top, is what happens when they made the dimension eight and dimension six coefficients equal. And then they played around in between, but you can see from looking at this, that potentially you could get 10 to 15% effects by including the dimension eight operators. And of course, from the point of view of the global fits, this is a huge effect. You don't really want a 10% uncertainty on your fit. The other, example of an agnostic approach to dimension eight operators is Drell-Yan production. And Drell-Yan production is a good place for us to study our understanding of the standard model effective field theory because Drell-Yan production is very precisely measured and it's also calculated in the standard model to very high order. So this allows for very significant limits on the SMEFT operators by comparing with the standard model calculated at high orders. So what, uh, these folks did as again, the agnostic approach, they picked out a lot of the different operators at dimension eight, which contributed to Drell-Yan. And then they sh showed that you could really change the spectrum of the dileptine pairs. 
So on the bottom here, it's the cross section normalized to the standard model. And you can see that when you go out to high invariant mass, so they're really high, here's odd at a TEV, they can potentially get very large effects from the dimension eight operators in the Drell-Yan spectrum. So here's some bounds that they have on their Drell-Yan four fermion operators. So there's a whole lot of operators here and they, they can get fairly significant bounds when they look just one at a time on these dimension eight, eight operators. So again, we have the potential that the picture of these fits ca can be changed by including these higher dimension operators. So now I'm gonna go to a model specific approach and I have two, oops. And I have two models to show you, one where the dimension eight are important and one where they aren't. So a popular model these days is to add a heavy charge two thirds vector like quark. And this is in my class of models that I talked about at the beginning, where the model's defined by a mass and a mixing angle. So it's very easy to determine the, the dimension eight operators which are generated in this particular model. And then we calculated TTH, including these dimension eight operators in this model. And what you can see from this plot is they're completely irrelevant. They do nothing whatsoever, unfortunately. So in this particular case, it appears you don't need the dimension eight operators. But here's a case where the dimension eight operators really, really change the physics. So the two HDM is a little bit more complicated than just the top vector like quark or the Higgs singlet model. So at dimension six, the two HGM generates operators, which can then be matched to the, the two HGM and the decoupling limit. So here are the operators. Here's OH. This is a phi to agar phi cubed operator, which I mentioned before in the singlet model. And here's the other operator that the two HGM generates at dimension six. And it's missed. It's missing a phi here. I'll correct my slide and repost it. So it's phi dagger phi, psi bar left phi, F right. So this is something that changes the mass term and changes the Yukawa coupling. And then at dimension eight, the two HGM generates more operators. And some of these operators have derivatives, which means they might change the kinematic spectrum. So a global fit to just the Higgs data in this, this example is very interesting in the two HGM because what we've done in this fit is including the dimension six squared term. So the one over lambda to the fourth terms, and then the dimension eight order one over lambda to the fourth terms match to the two HDM. So here's the type one two HDM. The exact model is the orange line in the middle. And when one does a SMEF fit at dimension six, you get this red, you get these lines over here that go off to the side. So the dimension six, SMEF matching completely fails to capture the physics of this type of model. And it's only when you put in the dimension eight that you get the red line, which is very close to the full model. So here's an example of you're trying to get new physics by fitting to SMEF coefficients. You do your fit to dimension six and it completely fails. So I think the answer is that we don't quite yet have an understanding of when it is we need these dimension eight operators. But we do know from things like the Drell-Yan fits and the fit to uh, HW that they can potentially give you fairly significant effects. So here's another fit, which uses the uh, code codex, which is a really nice code. So this can do these fits using the one loop matching. The previous plot here, this uses tree level matching at the UV scale. But this code can do the same thing, but use the one loop matching of the dimension six operators. And what it shows is that you get uh, different kinds of bounds on the different operators. So here, here is an operator, which is essentially the S parameter. And here is an operator, which is essentially the T parameter versus two other uh, operators, which are generated in the models. And what you see here is the electroweak precision data gives you one uh, region in phase space, and the Higgs data is another region in our parameter space. So again, it's a story that combining the different sources of data is much stronger than just one source of data alone. And again, this, is, this particular uh, plot uses differential Higgs information, which is something you get out of the SMEF as opposed to just fitting to uh, kappa functions. 
And finally, here's an example. Here's an example where the dimension eight effects completely change things. So this is using what's called a geosmeft approach to redo the electroweak precision fit using dimension six and dimension eight results. So this is, again, several different operators. Let's go over here to this one, which is familiar. This operator is essentially delta T and this one's essentially delta S. The red is a fit at dimension six and the uh, green is a fit at dimension eight. So here's an example where including the dimension eight results completely changes your, your conclusions. So does dimension eight matter? I don't think we know yet, but there's been a huge amount of progress in doing these agnostic approaches, doing these model dependent fits. And I think eventually we're gonna know the answer to this, but at the moment we don't know the size of the uncertainties from dimension eight. And now I wanna just talk for a few minutes about the higher order corrections, because we have some very impressive SMEF fits with higher order corrections. NLO QCD is now automated. You can take the code, turn the crank, run it, and get your SMEF predictions using NLO QCD. We now have one example of NNLO plus part-time showering QCD for making Z plus Higgs and then decaying to two leptons and two Bs. And so they fit to six operators. This process was chosen because it doesn't depend on too many operators. So it's a little bit simpler. And so here's what happens when they fit to a so-called dipole operator. So here's a so-called dipole operator. And you can see that this operator generates a significant change in the shape from the standard model. So here's the, uh, at the bottom, the change in the shape relative to the standard model. So again, it's an example of how the SMEF changes the shape of uh, the distributions. Unfortunately, this paper, they always have the NNLO results, but they don't tell me how much it changes from NLO, which I can get very easily. So that's a question I'd like to know the answer to, but it's definitely very impressive here, how big a shift in, in uh, shape you get. The standard model electroweak corrections are trickier than the QCD. And at the current time, the one loop electroweak corrections are done on a case by case basis. So right now we have electroweak precision observables, Grell Yan, Higgs gamma gamma, ZZ, a whole bunch of stuff. We know the loop corrections in the SMEF from electroweak. But in general, when one does these one loop electroweak corrections, what happens is that you get a dependence on many more operators than you have at tree level. So the electroweak NLO is not included in the global fits. For example, in the electroweak precision observables, at tree level, it depends on 10 operators, but at NLO electroweak, it depends on about 30 operators. So you lose the predictive power, but you can show that numerically, these effects are very important. On the, the left here, I have Drellian, and on the right, I have Higgs to gamma gamma. And what I've shown is the dependence. Here we have mu gamma, mu gamma gamma, the ratio of the standard of the observed, to, blah, 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 the predicted in the SMEF to the standard model rate. And you can see that depending on the coefficients, they can be quite large, uh, the contributions at one loop to H to gamma gamma. And similarly to Drellian, the one loop electroweak corrections from operators that don't occur at tree level can be very, very large. So we don't yet have all of the electroweak NLO corrections, although I think there's a worldwide program that is generating these, and eventually they'll be included in these fits. But numerically, we see that they can be very important. And finally, what about flavor? Well, we know that the top and the bottom are clearly different from the first and second generations. We know that the standard model has a U3 to the fifth flavor symmetry that the top quark breaks. So there have been some systematic investigations of the flavor structure in the SMEFT, and actually it's a very active area of study to try to think about how we include operators in the SMEF which have a flavor dependence. So for example, here's a simple fit to the electroweak precision observables which have different flavor assumptions when including the NLO electroweak. 
So the black lines here are flavor independent for fermion operators. The red lines, there's flavor only in the third generation. So you, what you should note from here is the difference in the fits between having flavor agnostic coefficients in my SMEF expansion, the black, or co coefficients in my SMEF expansion, which only depend on the top, the red. So it's very, very different depending on the flavor assumptions. And again, this is something that there's been a lot of progress on. So let me just end with this teaser plot. This is a plot showing what you can learn from electroweak precision observables about uh, flight operators that contribute uh, to uh, top quark interactions. So TT bar production, many of these flavor operators contribute to TT bar production. So these are the red, but you can infer these operators from electroweak precision observables. So for some operators, you can actually get stronger constraints on operators involving the top quark than you can from top quark production. So it's again a statement that we really need to include all of these things in our global fit. So let me just conclude here by saying there's just been a huge amount of progress in the standard model effective field theory predictions. We've got NLO QCD, we've got some NLO electroweak, we've got huge progress in these SMEF global fits because now they don't just include Higgs data, they include top dibose on electroweak precision observables. The FITs have started to think about the effects of the importance of the expansion, one over lambda squared, one over lambda to the fourth. We've made huge progress in this Higgs inverse problem in an understanding dimension eight operators and one loop matching, but there's still a lot to do. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so in fact, uh, you finished well in time and we have some uh, uh, good amount of time for discussion. Good, so, I like questions. <laughs> right, uh, let's see. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I, I can start with a small one, uh, going backward from this, uh, the flavor thing, the, the way uh, uh, I understand like, you know, this, um, when the people do this, um, EFT fit only considering all this RK, RK star, RD, RD star, and, and um, all this P5 prime and uh, all that you know that, uh, the, that the claim is that uh, four point uh, greater than four, four, some four sigma discrepancy with respect to the standard model prediction and uh, uh, this uh, Wilson coefficient, like whatever the C9, I'm forgetting the C9, C10. Mm -hmm. the, so the question is, um, if I take those uh, observable and then I add on the high energy counterpart of the Higgs uh, top and, and uh, the boson pair that you said, uh, how does the, the whole uh, thing uh, come together? Uh, like uh, what is the level of uh, consistency uh, with the standard model if I can ask? So what you, you want to say is that all these great and these Let's see, what do, you see, what do you see in my screen? Um, we see conclusion slide. Uh, slide. Okay, with this. okay, so the point is, is that it would be great to do a fit including everything together, but, but the fits from B physics tend to be, depend on different operators than the fits to the high energy. So I'm, I suspect you wouldn't learn too much by making your fit so global. I see. Because okay. it's C decays to, you know, whatever that really limits C9, C10. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, so, that's it. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, again a stupid question. Let's say we have made some differential distribution. Mm -hmm. so, uh, can you tell uh, starting from the DC? So, how do we go about it uh, to get the EFT interpretation? Oh, for the differential distributions? Well, you had a talk earlier about uh, STXSs, right? Mm -hmm. So I can generate my SMEF fit for each of these uh, bins. So you've got your differential distributions and you've got different bins. And in each bin, I can generate the SMEF fit. And that's how I do the fits. And in fact, that's included in these global fits. No, my point is that, okay, we start with the Lagrangian. Then mm -hmm. we 
uh, matrix element and uh, then we try to find out the differential distribution in terms of you know, these uh, coefficients. Is that true? Yes, that's exactly what you do. Okay. And uh, for uh, different uh, bins, uh, you are uh, saying that there will be different coefficients involved? Yeah. Yes. Well, what I would do, it's not the coefficients. I would calculate, say, D sigma DPT for PT between 100 and 200 or something. Yeah, yeah. And I would have, say, seven times coefficient one. But then I would go to a different bin and I would have, say, 7.2 times the same coefficient. So the numbers in front how of the coefficients and by matching the data. So how, why it is so and how it is so? This, uh, as you said, the coefficient in front will be different. Right, because, and this will be true for operators with derivatives, which have a yeah. momentum dependence. It will not be true for the operators with, with no momentum dependence. Oh, okay. this is the That's the point, is yeah. that it's the, it's a complicated, interesting operators with derivatives where this matters. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, so we have a question by Ram, so please uh, unmute and... Uh, hi, Sally, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so my question is regarding uh, like, uh, I think in the, in the beginning few slides where you mentioned that from 2,500 uh, around operators, you narrow down to 30 uh, using some assumptions. So how do you do that? Like what kind of assumptions are these? I mean, uh, you, like, well, you apply to eliminate possible operators in the Smith model? Well, most, most of the 2,499 has to do with flavor. So if you completely ignore flavor, you get, I believe, 59 operators, which is not so many. And then what you do is you look at which operators contribute to the processes you actually measure. So that, that's your criteria. So if you have that reasonable criteria, you get down to around 30, depending on assumptions. And that's why flavor is such a big deal, because once you put flavor in, you have way more operators than when you start. Thanks. So, of uh, course, for the global fit, one has to sit down and uh, write all the uh, observables and then express them in terms of a set of operators. But uh, can we say that uh, with uh, more statistics coming up, uh, say, next uh, few years' time, we will extend uh, this uh, dependence on higher order operators, higher dimension? Yes, with more statistics, then you can do fits to more operators, of course. Yeah, we will extend the, so again, going back to the earlier example, the differential distribution will go for higher PG and uh, then uh, there will be more meaningful, is that true? Yes, absolutely. Because the, as I said, the interesting operators have derivatives. So mm -hmm. then your expansion parameter is say PT squared over Lambda squared. So as you go out to higher PTs, you tend to get bigger effects. Yeah. So that's why inclusive cross sections, uh, they are not, I mean, total cross sections are not really very good. Compared to the differential. Oh, yeah. Differential cross sections are much more interesting from a small One can mainly say that uh, when we are talking about EFT, we are talking about effect of physics of very high energy. So unless we go to the differential level, we will not uh, get to see their effect. Well, that's not quite true. Because one of the advantages of the EFT is that it's a consistent field theory. So that means, unlike the Kappa framework, I can calculate the QCD corrections in a consistent way. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because the QCD corrections make a, make a pretty big difference in a lot of this stuff. Okay, just to act as a daily, then why can't we take the total cross sections we have got till now, fixed related, for example, say? and constrain some of these uh, EFT parameters? Yeah, you can, and people have, the experiments have. It's just so you'll get better, better constraints if you use the kinematic information. Yeah. So that's why during run two data, we were doing all these. Right, in the early data, there are, there are SMEF fits from the experiments from the total cross-section. Absolutely. It's just that now you can do better. Yeah. Okay. 
so I see okay. Dines. Uh, yeah, so Dines, uh, maybe uh, you, you go on asking your question. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this nice talk. So actually, I mean, in one of your slide that uh, in the model dependent approach, you considered this uh, vector like uh, heavy top. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, mean little bit uh, elaborate more for the motivation of this only because we have these uh, vector like uh, heavy top and uh, heavy bottom and maybe the double H or the triplet cases. But uh, what what is the motivation only for taking this uh, top vector line? Oh, you mean as opposed to taking a top and a bottom? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, not I mean, why only this uh, top? Uh, why not bottom and uh, top bottom? Oh, that for top. sure. Oh, well, if I took just bottom, it's highly constrained by B, B data. It's very hard to have a model with a BVLQ just because there's so much precision data on the bottom. The top bottom, one can make models. Yes, absolutely. I could have done that. But what happens, and the reason why it's not interesting here, is because the operators that are generated do not have any momentum dependence. So it only generates operators which modifies the Yukawa couplings. And I expect that would also be true if I had a TB model. So to get the interesting physics, I really need operators which change the kinematic spectrum. So okay. in hindsight, it's no surprise that this turned out to be boring. Okay, thank you. The model isn't boring, my fit is boring. Let me be clear. The model is very interesting. One should just look for these the vector like quarks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, okay, so I think uh, I do not see, um, any more hands up and uh, we don't have any more questions here in the room. So I would like to conclude the session and then thanking Sally once again and all the speakers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Very kind of you to give this talk very early in your morning. Right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Oh. Bye. I hope you will have a chance to come to India sometimes. Me too, I enjoyed it when I was there 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe it was 30, it's a long time ago. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, bye. bye.